Hello and welcome to the third video about writing for adult treble choirs. To say that choirs sing words may seem like stating the obvious, but if you look at many published arrangements, uh, let's say an a cappella arrangement of a pop song, how much of the time do the sections actually spend singing words? How much of the choir is actually allotted to sing real words? And how much of the choir is actually singing do wa Lu Lu Lu, and O oh, Baby. Um, I've certainly written my share of O oh, Babies and Do Was, but um, in general, I've come to feel that uh, certainly if you're writing your own piece, an original piece for a choir, there's no reason that all the sections shouldn't sing all the text, ideally. Okay, it may be fun to be an instrument from time to time and just sing vocables, but choir music is largely about text. And um, the corollary to that tenet of mine is that the text is the reason for the music, should be. The, the music should arise from the text, not the other way around. And uh, the text is not just something to give the singers to make verbal sounds while they're singing your music. Uh, the music should arise from the text. And so in that case, finding the right text is incredibly important. This can be the hardest part of composing, in a sense, uh, because you have to find a text that is available, that is appealing, and that is appropriate. Um, availability depends largely on copyright issues, and um, it can be quite a challenge to secure permission or a license to use a poem that is still in copyright. Be prepared to spend a lot of time and be very perseverant and to possibly spend a fair amount of money to acquire these rights. Uh, so of course, it's a lot easier, uh, makes sense to look for public domain material. Um, and there are some good online resources. Uh, constantly new literature is coming into the public domain as the copyright expires. And lists are published of what new material is available each year. You can find these online. Uh, of course, if you're arranging copyright material, there are a number of excellent platforms now available, which I highly recommend. Places like uh, Music Notes Marketplace and Arrange Me, which is the Hal Leonard uh, platform, uh, have large catalogs of music that, to which they uh, administer the rights. And if you wish to arrange one of these pieces, all you have to do is supply the correct copyright notice that they provide and uh, they deal with paying the, the copyright holder. They pay you and they, of course, pay themselves. And so the legal aspect of this uh, part of the job is taken care of in a very handy way. Another question about the text is, does it appeal? Does it appeal to you, naturally? It has to if you're going to be successful in composing a setting of it. And, um, but will it appeal to the general public as well? Uh, is it appropriate? Some texts that are perhaps older uh, may have language that's outdated, outmoded, archaic. And also ask yourself, does the text lend itself to choral expression? Uh, some texts, they may be very beautiful, they may be inspiring, um, but maybe they're very personal or idiosyncratic or quirky. Uh, even the texts of Emily Dickinson, I've always avoided because I find that they're just too, uh, too idiosyncratic for choral expression, which is essentially communal expression. It has to be something that the whole choir can get behind and sing as a group. Once you've found the text, it's your job to find the music in the text. But I always try to avoid initially uh, thinking of the text in musical terms, because I like to get to know the poem on its own terms, first of all. So I'd like to read to you a couple of quotes from two British 20th century composers talking about how they set poems to music. The first one is a man named Lennox Barclay. He wrote, one has only to think what a composer has to do to a poem. He has to destroy or at best modify its natural rhythm. He cannot possibly adhere to its actual meter. He then has to translate it into another medium. His only excuse for doing such a thing is that he feels he can recreate its atmosphere and feeling in the language of music. And here he can, if he's a good enough composer, heighten the emotional impact. 
He may even be able to bring out and stress certain rhymes and assonances that will enhance the actual words, but it remains a risky undertaking on which one hesitates to embark. Uh, the other quote is from Sir Michael Tippett. He wrote, the moment the composer begins to create the musical verses of his song, he destroys, there's that word again, our appreciation of the poem as poetry and substitutes an appreciation of his music as song. So I feel it's incumbent upon a composer before he takes a poem and destroys it uh, to encounter it on its own terms as much as possible, to really get to know it, uh, to understand its surface meaning, its uh, underlying meanings, if any, and um, to get to know it uh, technically as a, as a structure, as a composition. Um, and a very helpful resource for doing this um, is a book by, of all people, Stephen Fry. Um, it's a book called The Ode Less Traveled. And um, uh, he writes about uh, the topic of prosody, which is the study of poetry, oddly enough. And he writes in great detail, but it's very readable, it's very thorough, and it deals with all aspects of uh, meter, rhyme, and form in uh, traditional poetry, and some, uh, to some extent in modern verse as well. Literary devices such as alliteration and assonance, that's the repetition of consonant and vowel sounds, are important to, to discover and perhaps enhance in your musical setting. Diction, which is not the study of language, but actually in terms of poetry, it's who is the imaginary speaker of the poem? And what is the uh, style of the poem? Is it an elevated style? Is it a colloquial? Is it is it a soliloquy, uh, an elegy, um, a narration? That's all part of the so-called diction of the poem. Um, what is its form? Uh, there are rondos in poetry as there are in music. They're a little bit different, but similar. Uh, is it a ballad? Is it a limerick? Uh, is it in quatrains? Is it a sonnet? If it's a sonnet, uh, there are three different kinds. Which one is it? The meter of the poem. Uh, the poetic meter is the number and arrangement of the stresses in each poetic line. Uh, very important are the ideas of cesura and enjambment. Those are odd terms, but um, cesura refers to uh, where a grammatical unit stops in the middle of a poetic line, and enjambment is the opposite, where the sense continues from one line into the next. And in terms of musical phrasing, this is very important. Um, you don't want to put a pause or a breath in at the end of every poetic line necessarily uh, because the sense may, may cross over or may stop in the middle. Keep in mind that all this stuff applies mostly to traditional metrical poetry. And if you're setting a more modern poem in what's called free verse, um, you may have to look a little deeper to find the word patterns that the poet uses. Uh, they don't necessarily fall into uh, traditional patterns uh, or uh, styles. In this kind of poetry, uh, the form may even have a visual element, uh, something about the spacing on the page, the indentation, um, the typeset, the, the font even, uh, may be part of the form in a modern poem, and uh, a little study will be repaid, and it may be possible to reflect that in some way in your setting. So clearly, getting from poem to musical setting is really a process of translation, in a sense. And obviously, if you don't know a foreign language, you can't translate it into your language. If you don't know the poem uh, as a poem, you can't really translate it into music. And although there are uh, elements that relate, meter and so on, that relate to musical elements, um, the process of translating them is not a one-on-one -on -one equivalence by any means, and the process is different for every poem and with every composer, certainly. But uh, the more you study the poem in its, on its own terms, the better chance you'll have of uh, making a setting that enhances it rather than destroys it. Poetic forms rarely yield musical forms. In fact, some things that work well within a poem don't create a very satisfying musical structure. Uh, a famous poem by Tennyson is Ring Out Wild Bells. Great poem, but it's a list essentially. Ring in this, ring out that, ring in the 
good thing ring out the evil thing. And uh, it's very effective. It has a cumulative effect when it's spoken. But musical structures really rely on a repetition of sections, something that returns. Um, and a list doesn't have that same effect. So it's a challenge to recreate the structure of that poem in a piece of music. Even uh, sonnets, which are one of the most uh, familiar kinds of forms of poetry, they are 14 line poems. And if you think about a lot of music that runs in four bar phrases and eight bar periods, a 14 line poem may end up sounding somewhat incomplete. You may feel like it's ending in the middle of a symmetrical section. If you want to look at a piece of mine where I dealt with that very problem, uh, for, uh, one I wrote for Electra actually is called Pity Me Not. It's a great poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay. And I used uh, many, every possible technique to uh, extend the 14, bar, the 14 line feeling into a, a, a sense of musical completion. So a certain amount of rearrangement may be necessary to the text that you have uh, to start with. But, and a certain amount of uh, repetition may be necessary, may be justifiable, even omission occasionally. But be careful about how you break up the text and how you repeat it. Too much repetition may trivialize uh, the text uh, rather than stressing it or enhancing it. And um, uh, a good example of how not to uh, break up a text is uh, in a setting I saw maybe in my imagination, I won't say for sure, uh, but a setting of Robert Frost's poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. It must have been in my imagination because uh, it's actually illegal to use that text in a musical setting. But um, uh, the text that says about you're in the farmer's field and uh, watching the snow fall, and the poem says, he will not see me stopping here to, to uh, see his woods fill up with snow. The composer said it like this, he will, he will not. He will, he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Clearly not the most effective way to interpret that poetic line. Here are some more pitfalls that you might fall into uh, in setting texts. Uh, in the first one, you'll see that the alto ones begin a word, the alto twos begin a new word, and the sopranos finish with a third word. The problem with this is that um, the alto twos actually only sing the beginning of their word. So do the alto ones. And by the time the sopranos join in, all you have is an unblendable jumble of vowels um, and two words that you've only heard the front end of, you don't really know how they end. When the conductor gives the cutoff, all you're going to have there is a jumble of different consonants and diphthongs. The end of the word rejoice, the end of the word shout, and the end of the word sing. And you won't actually be able to discern any of those words very likely. In the second example, you see where the composer has used uh, an effect that might be very effective in an instrumental setting. Uh, it might be very beautiful, but um, unfortunately, it leaves everyone but the soprano ones to sing only a part of a word. And it's very unsatisfying as a soprano two to have to only sing the syllable ya when the soprano ones are singing alleluia. Notating text at music, finally, has a lot to do with what we call text underlay. And that uh, includes matters of hyphenation, uh, word extensions, beaming, and slurring. So hyphenation, believe it or not, there is a correct and an incorrect way to split a multisyllable word in the English language and in other languages that are alphabetic. Uh, any dictionary will show you the correct uh, way to split a word. Um, there are lots of complicated rules about it, uh, but eventually you'll acquire a bit of an intuition and it all comes down to common sense and really retain its, its constituent units in identifiable ways. The other thing that music, uh, texted music requires is extensions. And these are solid lines at the base of a text, not in the middle, at the base of a text, which are used for single words and the final syllables of words where more than one note goes to that syllable. 
uh, beaming. Uh, the North American and modern way to show the correct beaming is uh, only to refer to the meter. Uh, and so the beaming has nothing to do with the underlay. Uh, the rhythm and meter dictate how the uh, passage is to be beamed. And if you've studied your music rudiments, you'll know how that works in 6-8 and in 3-4 and in all different meters. Slurring is the way that we show the, which syllable pertains to which note in uh, vocal music. Um, and so slurs in vocal music have actually nothing to do with articulation. They only indicate which syllable goes with which note. Uh, you can't tell on the basis of a slur whether it's legato or staccato. It could be either. Now this brings up the question of how much you want to notate about cutoffs and uh, consonants and so on. Just know that all choirs spend an inordinate amount of time fussing about where consonants go. And often a choir that sounds like they're mush-mouthed uh, is just because the singers haven't been given enough detailed information about where the consonants go. And so they start leaving them off in order to not conflict with their neighbors. Um, so, as a composer, just know that that is the case. Uh, and if you can put in helpful rests at the end of phrases, uh, change a whole note to a dotted half, let's say, uh, that will help to solve the problems. The uh, conductor will still fuss with it, I'm sure, but that will give them a starting place at least to know where uh, breaks are expected and uh, possible. Looking at these examples, you'll see how important uh, correct hyphenation is. That first word is almost unrecognizable. Hal el uj, looks like some Arabic word or something. Likewise, I defy anyone to tell me what meter that first example is in. The incorrect beaming obscures the meter, makes it virtually unreadable. So down below, you can see the corrected version, correct beaming, uh, instead of the 16th note rests to indicate articulation, uh, I've simply used staccatos. And um, also you'll see that the dynamic indication is positioned correctly above the staff. In the second example, this composer, again, probably uh, non-existent, uh, he obviously knew that you could use hyphens to extend the syllables of a word over several notes, but perhaps he wasn't aware of the uh, use of extensions for the last syllable or single pitches. And obviously he thought that uh, where you have two notes to one syllable, you have to divide up the letters of the syllable. Not a good idea as it creates unrecognizable words and unsingable words. So in the fixed version, you'll see the, the hyphenation is correct, the slurs have been added, uh, even a dotted slur where uh, no breath might be desired, and phrase marks have been added to show the division of the phrases. Just makes it visually a lot easier to take in. Despite all the hazards of writing music with texts and the pitfalls that one can easily fall into, I still think it's worth acquiring the extra bit of knowledge uh, to do it right because the richness and the subtlety of the interplay of music and text is a wonderful thing. The meaning, the sounds of music and the form of music combined with the meaning and the sounds and the forms of poetry can be an incredibly rich thing and uh, worth, well worth the added effort that it takes to compose a setting. So that's all I have to say about text. I hope you've enjoyed and found this helpful. To see a written summary of the points we've just discussed uh, and to look at the musical examples again, you can go to the URL that you see on the screen or in the description below the video. Thank you for listening.